Emotions matter. They make us feel alive. They filter what we remember about experiences. They influence what we choose to do and where we choose to go. As we heard from Avi, you're on yesterday, emotions affect our health and how likely we are to recover from an illness. And we're surrounded today by amazing technology devices in our pockets that can help us find directions almost anywhere in the world. They can translate languages on the fly, can search the internet using images at the, and get results back in a split second. But despite all of this cognitive intelligence that we've been uh, designing computers to have, they don't have much emotional intelligence. They can't sense and understand us as human beings in the way that we understand other humans. Imagine if when you woke up in the morning, you could look in the mirror and it would know whether you'd had a bad night's sleep or whether you were anxious about the day ahead. Uh, when you go to your fridge, um, the things that you take out, your devices are able to correlate, with that, correlate that with how you feel and help you understand how your diet's affecting your behavior and your life and, and your health uh, and your emotions. When you get in your car and drive to work for the next hour, it's helping you understand how stress is impacting uh, your life and whether you're likely to um, get ill in uh, the next day or so. That's the potential of emotion-aware computing, devices that can sense, understand, and adapt to human emotions. On a more serious note, how about a device that uses similar sensor data and through a smartwatch or smartphone can help you care for someone who's suffering from depression, allowing them to share updates on their mood with you or a clinician and help track the progress of treatment. Have any of you experienced frustration using technology? Has any, anyone here had a moment like this? There's actually whole YouTube channels devoted to people smashing up uh, their computers or screaming at electronics. And although it can be amusing to watch, it's something that I think many of us can associate with. So not only would devices that can sense our emotions and our behavior be able to help us live more healthy lives, they could just make our interactions with everyday technology much more pleasant, much more fluid, and I believe help us interact with that technology in a way that um, means we have to look less at screens uh, and actually spend more time interacting with each other. When I was an undergrad, I was studying machine learning and applying these advanced models to predicting financial markets and uh, other complex uh, systems. But I really wanted to see how it could have an impact uh, in, in a much more human way. How could we uh, design technology with, a so with social skills, uh, the ability to understand us and interact with us in a much more natural way? Understanding human behavior is probably the first step to uh, building emotionally intelligent devices. We need to be able to have sensors that can capture people's facial expressions, their physiology, their speech patterns, and that's hard, it's a, it's a difficult thing to do because we act uh, very differently at different times and emotions are ill-defined. Uh, they're subjective, they're experiences which are difficult to pin down. Much of my work focuses on using cameras and algorithms to try to capture these signals, to be able to quantify how people are feeling. So let's start with one of the richest sources of emotional information, the human face. How can we teach your iPad, your cell phone, to understand your emotions? 
In order to do this with facial expressions, we need to give a computer a huge number of images which have been painstakingly coded by humans using a taxonomy to label what muscle movements are present and what facial expressions are there. The more variety and larger number of these images we can give the computer, the more accurately it will learn these models. It takes information from the shape and texture of the face to capture uh, descriptions of what a smile looks like, what a brow furrow looks like, um, and also what an expression of disgust uh, looks like. But that's enough about the, the technology. Let's try a demo. So I've asked uh, these uh, guys in the front of the audience to uh, take part in this demo. So um, if you guys in the front could look towards the camera. <laughs> so, if we can get you uh, so what we're doing here is tracking uh, the face, identifying uh, different landmarks, so where the eyebrows, mouth, and nose are, and uh, identifying what facial expressions, um, what facial actions are present. Uh, on the bottom, uh, you can see a graph which is tracking over time how positive or negative those expressions are. And we can do this in real time. And uh, if I move this across, we should be able to do it with multiple people. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, so what we can do with this is uh, measure the responses of people um, in uh, very natural settings. What we've been doing is training these algorithms to work um, even when there's harsh contrast on the face, when people are in, um, in their own homes, uh, when we don't have control over lighting and can necessarily specify uh, what they're, um, where they're looking um, and things like that. Thank you very much. When I was at MIT, um, we were looking at facial expressions and how to train computers uh, to recognize those, but we also wanted to find ways that we could gather more information from the human face. Is there any other information about someone's emotional state that we can capture? And uh, we found that by using signal processing and uh, looking at the light reflected uh, from the face, uh, we could analyze the video and extract physiological signals. Uh, you, by measuring subtle variations in how light is reflected, we could capture blood flow, measure heart rate and respiration rates. And this gives us a, a whole other dimension to capture someone's emotions. We not only see what they're expressing outwardly, but also uh, what's happening on the inside, the in, inward manifestations of the emotional state. And that has huge implications potentially for um, healthcare and other uh, things like that. So we're applying this in hospitals in Boston to uh, measure peripheral blood flow, to be able to identify um, uh, conditions uh, where there's restricted blood flow to limbs, which can cause um, discomfort and even result in amputation. Um, but on the emotional level, it gives us information um, continuously about how someone's responding, even if they're not expressing something on their face. But we wanted to go further than that. Heart rate alone is not um, that informative about emotions necessarily. We wanted to see whether we could measure subtle changes due to people's levels of stress. And looking at the changes, the variations of beats uh, of the heart over time, uh, we can measure what's known as heart rate variability. And we found that using the camera, using an ordinary webcam, looking at the face, uh, we can tell whether someone is under stress uh, when they're using their computer versus um, when they're in a more relaxed state uh, by looking at their heart rate variability, looking at their what's known as sympathetic nervous system response. And this has Again, big implications about what we can do with this technology. Uh, stress is, has a huge impact on people's lives. Uh, it affects our quality of life. And 
I believe there's a lot of potential benefits uh, of this technology. In fact, recently, uh, we've been looking at how other types of sensors can capture similar data using um, actually very similar algorithms. We can look at the vibrations of the body and capture the same type of information. Uh, so using accelerometers in a, in a wristwatch or a smartphone, we can capture vibrations of the body and recover someone's heart rate, uh, respiration rate as well. Uh, and these are devices that we have on us all the time. They weren't designed for measuring, necessarily for measuring our physiology or our emotions, uh, but they can capture this information uh, and they can do it um, even perhaps when we're not expecting them to. And although you know, I believe this technology has many really compelling applications, you're right, and you may be thinking, well, that's kind of, it's kind of scary that someone could measure my emotions without, um, uh, without me realizing that these devices were capable of doing that. And I think as a, an engineer and scientist, as we develop this technology, it's crucial that we think about the, the social impact uh, that it will have. And I'm really keen, um, and in all of the experiments we run, to have people actively opt in to share their data, uh, to be a part of these experiments um, and be aware of what's being captured. In addition, as we develop the sensing capabilities and these, uh, the, the software that can capture people's emotional state, we need to develop ways that people can opt out. They can put a mute button on these sensors. They can say, I want to mask my emotions, like we do in social situations as human beings. We smile when we're sad, to, um, when we go out to a social occasion in many cases. And having that ability uh, to be able to mask our emotions is really important. Um, so I think as we develop the sensing capabilities, we should also develop the abilities to, to manage um, how and when we're measured. But what's really encouraging and what's really necessary in order to develop these applications for, for um, really good purposes is that people share their data. Uh, we can't build these models of emotion unless um, people want to, uh, want to contribute data. And over the past four years, uh, using many, many studies, we've collected the world's largest database of human emotion measurements. Uh, people have opted in to share uh, videos from their webcams, um, in many cases when they're in their own homes, when they're watching TV or uh, watching online content, they've um, chosen to switch on their webcam and share their emotional expressions with us. Uh, so we've collected millions of videos from around the world, so over three and a half million videos from 75 countries. And this database has huge, huge scientific significance we can start to look at psychological theories um, in a, uh, and use observable data to validate them or perhaps even to um, suggest different uh, ways in which we express ourselves. We've been looking at this data and looking at how demograph different demographics express emotions differently. We found that males and females, surprise, surprise, are different. Uh, there, there's... Um, there appears to be a social norm uh, which is uh, fairly universal across almost every country in the world for males to express more negative and a less positive emotion than females. And this is manifested in, in the ways that we smile and furrow our brows and frown. And this is really important data because we can now build sensors to capture what people are expressing, but also build models that take into account the fact that different people actually express emotions in very different ways. We found that there's cultural differences, and these can be very large, that people in the US and uh, Western countries tend to express more on their face than people in, in Asian countries. But actually, it's the setting um, that moderates this. So when in an indiv individualistic society like in, in the US, People tend to express more positive emotion when they're in an out, what's known as an out-group setting, when they're with people that aren't in their close friendship group or family. Whereas if you go to a collectivist culture like in uh, South America or in Asia, 
People tend to express more positive emotion when they're with, it, with their close friends, with their family, and less positive emotion uh, when with their out group. And this is, um, this is in line with theories in psychology that suggest that uh, in that type of culture, there's more incentive to build those close-knit groups. It's really encouraging to see this large-scale observational data back up those theories and allow us to take the science um, a whole lot further. So this technology allows us to sense how people are feeling, um, both on the inside and on the outside, what they're expressing and how their physiology is responding. And we can build these models to uh, adapt uh, to culture, to gender, to different age groups. The two applications that I'm um, most passionate about are ways that we can improve uh, education and healthcare. At the moment, there's a, a massive proliferation of online courses. People are able to get high-quality education uh, across the world in a much more scalable way by uh, taking part um, and hearing online lectures and uh, taking courses via the internet. But for teachers, there's no way uh, anymore to get feedback from their students about when they're struggling uh, or when they're engaged with a, a class especially when this learning is happening asynchronously. It would be amazing if we could allow these students to switch on their webcam and contribute that data back, aggregate it in an anonymous way, and allow an educator to understand what parts of their lessons are easy to understand, what parts are engaging, uh, and help them improve the quality of their content. And we can do that all now, just using the hardware that's available to everyone that's using uh, or taking these online courses. From education to healthcare, as I mentioned at the start, there's conditions which are extremely hard to track. And they're conditions which are becoming more and more problematic. Uh, depression is a, is a condition that affects many people. And at the moment, uh, clinicians have no good way of really understanding how someone's behavior is changing during a treatment program. They don't know whether a drug is really um, having a positive impact. And in many cases, people would want to share that data but just don't know how. A self-report survey where you have to write down how you feel is, is not very effective. By using this type of sensor data, we could quantify how someone feels, how they behave, and give that information to clinicians to help them track and better care for patients suffering from these types of conditions. So I believe that this technology will help us interact much more naturally with technology around us. It will help us live healthier lives and ultimately uh, help us care for one another more effectively. Thank you. I've just got one question for you, Daniel. Yep. Has the US National Security Agency been in touch? That's a good question. It's a question a lot of people ask. Um, That's they, not an they, answer. We, we haven't, we've stayed away from those types of applications. And I actually really genuinely believe that it's not the most effective use of this technology. Um, there are many TV shows like Lie to Me, which popularize this notion that facial expressions could be used to detect whether someone's lying. But in high-risk situations, a human is going to be better than, um, than, than a computer at this stage. And there are many cases where you just don't have a friend who can you know, be with their, their, their companion with depression the whole time and, and help you know, measure how they're feeling. This type of technology is much more effective at, at doing things that, where that's required, a, a sort of longitudinal and scalable measure of but capturing Going someone's back to emotion. my question, has sure. the NSA been in touch? Not, not to me directly. I, I don't know. No, not, not, to, not to my research group, no. Hmm. We'll leave the audience <laughs> to work it out. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. Thanks.